Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to today's PDC Worldwide Lab meeting. Uh, we have two, uh, two uh, slightly, slightly more junior uh, speakers to talk today, but who are going to talk about some really exciting work that's coming out of work on bipolar disorder and, and depression. Um, the first speaker is Neve Mullins. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, she received her PhD in statistical genetics from King's College London in 2017. Um, her current research focuses on conducting gene wall studies of bipolar disorder and suicide. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Neve. Thanks a lot, Jerome, and thank you for the opportunity to present on the call today. Um, I'll be presenting the results of a new GWAS on bipolar disorder. This is a meta-analysis mainly of PGC samples and a couple of external studies as well. Um, I should emphasize these are preliminary results. Uh, this is not yet a freeze, and I'll highlight as I go through the talk uh, some of our future plans for this work. So uh, to start with a bit of background, bipolar disorder is a severe psychiatric disorder that's characterized by swings in mood ranging from manic episodes to depressive episodes. And within bipolar disorder, there are also several subtypes. Uh, for example, type 1 bipolar disorder, which is characterized by manic episodes, type 2, which is characterized by hypomanic episodes, and also schizoaffective disorder, which shares some symptoms with schizophrenia. Bipolar disorder has a heritability of over 70% and a prevalence of 1% in the population. And so in these respects, it's very similar to schizophrenia. Um, in terms of genetic studies on bipolar disorder, the largest and most recent GWAS has been conducted by the PGC. This is a paper which is up on BioArchive at the moment and is under review. And this study identified 19 loci reaching genome-wide significance for bipolar disorder in a discovery study of over 20,000 cases and over 30,000 controls. And this number increased to 30 genome-wide significant loci in a meta-analysis of SNPs reaching a p-value of less than 10 to the minus 4 in that discovery study with 9,000 additional cases from follow-up samples. So the main new addition to this is the PGC bipolar disorder psych chip data. Uh, this sample consists of almost 12,000 bipolar disorder cases and 18,000 controls of European ancestry. And it's made up of many more uh, smaller cohorts from Europe, the US and Australia, which were contributed to the PGC psych chip effort, which started back in 2013 and was led by Pamela Sklar and by Ben Neal. These samples were genotyped on the Illumina psych chip at Mount Sinai and the Broad Institute. And the chip has three parts. Uh, today I'll be focusing on the GWAS backbone part of the chip, but we do also have the exome content and the custom psychiatric content on these samples as well. The Ricopilli program was used to perform all of the standard QC on the data sets, um, perform imputation to the haplotype reference consortium panel and uh, Cases and controls were matched based on PCA into 11 psych chip cohorts for analysis. And in addition to these 11 psych chip cohorts, this meta-analysis also includes the 32 cohorts from the PGC2 GWAS, as well as three other follow-up samples uh, which were used in the PGC2 paper. And since then, all of the imputation of these cohorts has been updated to the haplotype reference consortium. Uh, we're also including the decode and iPsych samples in this meta-analysis and recently both of these have had an update from their registries so they now include additional cases and controls. So in total there are 48 cohorts in the meta-analysis uh, with a sample size of almost 38,000 bipolar disorder cases and almost 250,000 controls. Um, a lot of these controls of course are coming from the decode study. So these are the meta-analysis results. There are 53 genome-wide significant loci, 22 of which are novel. Uh, the SNP heritability is 18% on the liability scale as calculated using LD score regression. 
Here I'm showing the known loci for bipolar disorder which have replicated in this GWAS, so either from the PGC2 paper or from other GWAS on bipolar disorder which have been published previously. And these are not necessarily the causal genes, but these are labels by which these loci have been known so that they can be identified here. And many of these regions will be very familiar to people. And these are the novel loci which um, have come up in this GWAS, um, which I'm labeling here uh, by the nearest gene to the top lead SNP. And probably the first thing you'll notice from this Manhattan plot is that the MHC has now reached genome-wide significance for bipolar disorder for the first time. Um, and I'll go into that in more detail and compare it to the MHC signal in schizophrenia. But other notable novel associations here are uh, the CACNA B2 calcium channel, um, which has been previously associated with schizophrenia. Uh, the furin gene, um, also a schizophrenia association, um, this has a well-known neurodevelopmental role um, and is involved in activating BDNF. MIR124, again, is a schizophrenia association. Um, two of these novel loci have very recently been uh, implicated in major depression at genome-wide significance in the most recent uh, GWAS, um, which will be um, covered in the next presentation. And I'll return to some of these um, loci later to follow up on them using some EQTL data from brain tissue. I use the FUMA online platform to perform some enrichment analyses of the GWAS summary statistics using MAGMA. So from gene-based tests, there were 221 significant genes after a Bonferroni correction. From a pathway analysis or a gene set enrichment analysis, um, there was significant enrichment of signal in genes involved in the regulation of synaptic plasticity, and that was the only significant gene set. And in a magma tissue expression analysis using data from 53 GTEx tissues, uh, there was a significant enrichment of signal in genes expressed in 12 brain tissues and not in other tissues, uh, with the most significant enrichment being in the frontal cortex. These are regional association plots showing the uh, MHC signal in uh, bipolar disorder compared with schizophrenia. So the signal looks broadly similar across the extended MHC. Um, the top lead SNPs, which are shown here in dark purple, are in LD with each other um, with an R squared of 0.7. Um, I've labeled the C4 genes here in schizophrenia. Um, the C4 region didn't reach genome-wide significance in bipolar disorder. It's still on that threshold, um, but the axes are not the same here. All of the p-values in bipolar disorder are larger than in schizophrenia. But to take a closer look at this region in bipolar disorder, here I'm showing some conditional analyses in the MHC. So the first figure shows uh, the signal in the extended MHC in bipolar disorder in the psych chip samples. And the second figure is that signal again after conditioning on the top lead SNP, uh, which shows that we're looking at one signal across a lot of the proximal MHC here, um, extending in low LD almost as far as the C4 region, um, at, uh, 32 megabases. And then the third figure is um, the region after conditioning on the top lead signal from the schizophrenia GWAS, um, showing again that the association signals come down. There is some correlation between the signals in the two disorders. But to specifically investigate the C4 region, uh, this is some work um, by Hannah Young, a PhD student here at Mount Sinai, and she used the protocol and reference panel uh, by Sakara et al. to um, impute the C4 structural variants in the psych chip data sets um, from SNP data, and then use those imputed structural variants um, to predict the expression level of the C4A gene. Um, and there was no association between predicted C4A expression and bipolar disorder. And here I'm showing um, the p-values for those associations added to the locus zoom plot, um, both before and after conditioning on the top bipolar disorder signal. So while a lot of the MHC association signal uh, looks similar between bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, we're not seeing any evidence for the involvement of complement C4 in bipolar disorder. 
to follow up on some of the other genome-wide significant loci from this study, uh, since we know that GWAS hits are enriched for EQTLs and uh, we saw enrichment of signals in genes expressed in brain tissue, I wanted to follow up on these uh, GWAS loci using some EQTL data from brain tissue. And so for this, I used uh, data on EQTLs in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex from the Common Mind Consortium. Um, these EQTL associations have been published previously, and I used the fusion software, which trains models of SNPs in the cis region of the genes, uh, predicting gene expression. Um, these weights had also been trained on the Common Mind data, are freely available online. And these models can then be used to predict association between gene expression and bipolar disorder using GWAS summary statistics. And while this is often done transcriptome-wide for any genes which have heritable expression in the prefrontal cortex, here I was specifically interested in following up on the genome-wide significant loci from this study. So that was 23 out of the 53 GWAS loci um, that contained at least one gene with heritable expression in the prefrontal cortex. And here I'm showing the Manhattan plot again with the labels reduced to those 23 loci that I can follow up on. So there were 14 loci uh, containing genes where bipolar disorder associated SNPs influence the expression of genes in the prefrontal cortex. So for example, here I'm showing that SNPs in the cis region of the TRANK1 gene um, are also um, reducing the expression of TRANK1 in the prefrontal cortex. And these are loci where the nearest gene or the gene I had labeled on the plot is altered in expression, but sometimes it's not the nearest gene. It can be another gene in the locus which um, emphasizes the potential importance of these genes in the etiology of bipolar disorder. And we saw a couple of hotspots as well um, of gene expression where um, multiple genes in the expression of multiple genes in a locus was associated with uh, bipolar disorder. And it was nice as well to see support for some of the novel regions from this GWAS um, using EQTL data. So, for example, the furin gene, um, PLEC, which plays a role in linking different parts of the cytoskeleton, um, KIAA1109, which may have a role in um, endocytosis of synaptic vesicles. These figures show the performance of polygenic risk scores uh, generated from these new GWAS summary statistics. So here I'm showing the results after running leave one out meta-analysis, excluding in turn each of the psych chip samples um, to make independent polygenic risk scores to predict into uh, those as target samples. The R squares here are on the liability scale, so they're comparable across these cohorts, and the weighted average R squared uh, by sample size across the cohorts uh, was about 4%. So even though uh, we have seen many more genome-wide significant loci from this GWAS compared with the PGC2 bipolar disorder paper, we haven't uh, really seen a comparable increase in the performance of polygenic risk scores. Although I should note that on average, the heritability of bipolar disorder was lower from these psych chip samples, um, and that does put a limit on the R squares that can be achieved using uh, polygenic scoring. Um, so we do need to extend this um, and run leave one out uh, meta analysis into all of the uh, samples in the study, and then I expect that R squared will increase a bit further. These are the results of genetic correlations between bipolar disorder and a range of other diseases and traits uh, from LD Hub. Um, over 750 traits were tested using, um, including all of the new kit. UK biobank traits, which are now on LD Hub. Um, there were 103 uh, significant correlations with bipolar disorder after a von Froni correction. And here I'm showing some of the significant and most interesting of those genetic correlations. We saw high genetic correlations between bipolar disorder and adult onset psychiatric disorders, um, a positive genetic correlation with educational attainment, as has been reported previously for bipolar disorder. 
The bars in purple here are UK biobank traits. Um, and the first of these is not from LG Hub, but this is a GWAS on bipolar disorder that was conducted in the UK biobank. And we worked with our collaborators at King's College London to define a bipolar disorder phenotype in the UK biobank using ICD codes, um, using the mental health questionnaire and nurse interviews. And we saw um, a correlation between these GWAS results and the results of our current study um, of 0.83. And this is very promising as we're now working to include the UK Biobank in this meta-analysis. Other um, interesting genetic correlations seen with UK biobank traits were um, with be, ever being manic or hyper, um, risk-taking behaviour, which is, of course, a notable feature of bipolar disorder. And just to mention as well, uh, some genetic correlations that we didn't see with bipolar disorder for comparison with other psychiatric disorders. Uh, we didn't see any correlations with childhood onset psychiatric disorders um, with any of the reproductive traits tested with anthropometric traits traits, um, immune or cardiometabolic traits. So to summarize the study, we've reached almost 38,000 bipolar disorder cases. Um, there are 15 with significant loci, 22 of which are novel. The SNP heritability is 18% on the liability scale and polygenic scores are explaining about 4% of variance in case control status. Um, we saw significant enrichment of genes involved in regulating synaptic plasticity um, and integrating EQTL data from the prefrontal cortex um, provided support for um, many of the genome-wide significant loci, including several of the novel loci from this study. So the last couple of slides that I have are um, just taking a look at the bigger picture and um, looking at some more general future directions. So where are we now with bipolar disorder, GWAS? And this is a figure that was put together recently by Pat Sullivan, plotting the number of genome-wide significant loci versus the number of cases um, for PGC disorders. And uh, we have here both published results and the results of ongoing work within the PGC. Um, and I've extended this back to PGC1 for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, so we can see the rate of increase in GWAS hits for sample size. And so looking at the current bipolar disorder, GWAS, it definitely looks like uh, we're on the incline here. Um, we've seen a large number of um, more genome-wide significant associations from the current GWAS compared with PGC2 um, for probably a modest increase in sample size. Um, the rate I've calculated is uh, one new locus for every 350 cases added. And it looks like this rate of discovery may even improve further um, with increases in sample size. You can see that it's even more steep here going from PGC2 schizophrenia to the PGC2 plus class UK study. But one thing that is glaring from this figure is that uh, there's a big difference in the number of GWAS hits from the current GWAS on bipolar disorder compared with the PGC2 schizophrenia GWAS. And these are two studies that have a similar number of cases, uh, two disorders that have a similar heritability and prevalence in the population. And one reason for this could be differences in the genetic architecture uh, between bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So to try and get some insights into this, um, I took a look at the distribution of effect sizes between the two disorders. So this histogram shows um, the distribution of odds ratios from the current bipolar disorder, GWAS. And this is the same figure um, plotting effect sizes from the PGC2 schizophrenia, GWAS. And so if you overlay these two histograms, um, it's very clear that the effect sizes are typically larger in schizophrenia compared with bipolar disorder, and there's a significant difference between them. Um, and so given this, it's maybe not a surprise then that the um, PGC2 schizophrenia study found many more uh, genome-wide significant loci than the current um, bipolar disorder G was. Um, uh, one potential reason for um, smaller effect sizes in bipolar disorder could be the genetic heterogeneity that exists within the, the disorder. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, there are several subtypes of bipolar disorder. Um, and we've now seen evidence for the genetic heterogeneity between those subtypes. Um, I'm showing here some results from the PGC2 bipolar disorder paper. 
showing differences in SNP heritability between type 1 and type 2 bipolar disorder. Um, even though the genetic correlation between the subtypes is high, it is in one. Um, and polygenic risk scores um, for schizophrenia, which are uh, shown in the left figure here, um, were found to distinguish between type 1 and type 2 bipolar disorder cases, um, being higher in type 1 cases. Um, and some further exploration of this was, result was found it was found that this is driven by the presence of psychotic symptoms in um, type 1 bipolar cases. Similarly, in the right figure, the polygenic score for depression uh, can also distinguish between type 1 and type 2 bipolar disorder cases, but being higher in type 2 cases um, who suffer more from depressive episodes. Um, so, Given this heterogeneity within the disorder, um, this could make effect sizes smaller and more difficult to detect in GWAS. And I think there are two main strategies to tackle this, um, both of which we intend to use going forward. Um, and one is to increase sample sizes for bipolar disorder, um, but another is to um, focus on subtypes of bipolar disorder, which are perhaps more genetically homogenous. So in terms of future directions, uh, we really need additional samples of bipolar disorder and uh, we have a huge um, effort um, underway to recruit more samples. Um, if you know of any samples um, or have any samples and would like to be involved, please do get in touch with us. Um, you can contact Ole Andreessen, who's chair of the Bipolar Disorder Working Group. Um, in case we have any non-PGC members on the call today, I thought I'd also just highlight that the PGC now have a data intake officer, Rachel Lucier, who has set up an online platform um, to make inquiries about contributing data um, I think this will be added to the website, um, but um, basically it's very easy to become involved and we're very enthusiastic to have new members in the Bipolar Disorder Working Group. Another thing we're also doing is collecting subphenotype data in bipolar disorder and this is already available for some of the cohorts um, but not for all and um, not for the new psych chip samples um, and so collecting this sort of data on the cohorts will allow um, exploration of the genetic heterogeneity within bipolar disorder um, and will also facilitate analysis of subtypes um, across bipolar disorder and other disorders. As I mentioned, uh, we focus so far on the uh, GWAS backbone of the psych chip. We do also have the rare variant content from the chip, which has yet to be examined. And the CNV working group are also calling CNVs from the bipolar disorder samples. Uh, so we hope that in the near future, we'll have data on um, genetic variation across uh, the entire frequency of um, genetic variants. And so I'd like to finish by uh, thanking everyone who's involved in this work. Um, I've listed here all the members of the investigative team who have worked on all of these data sets and really brought this meta-analysis together. I'd like to acknowledge Georgia at Charité who updated the imputation and analysis of the PGC2 cohorts. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisor Eli Stahl here at Mount Sinai for all of his input into this work and of course the Bipolar Disorder Working Group and the psych chip PIs of the PGC. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Neve, for a great presentation. Um, so we have uh, about five minutes for questions now. So uh, if you want to make a question, um, if you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, you can, you can do a question or you can, you can put it in the, in the chat, win chat window. So, okay, so Neve, let, let me ask the question. So with, with regard to heritability estimates from the site chip and, and so on, because it's a sparser GWAS backbone, um, on average, you would expect the imputation, I guess, to be slightly worse when it's more sparse. Do, do you think that that explains in some, in some part the, the lower heritability estimates that you get? So it's because you've got less information gathered from the genome? So the heritability estimates I'm looking at are from LD score regression. Um, and so that typically uses a set of half map three SNPs that are very well imputed across different panels. Um, and um, they should all be there within the psych chip 
there were not fewer um, variants going into those heritability calculations between psych chip and the PGC2 samples. Um, so I don't think that explains the difference in heritability between psych chip versus other PGC cohorts. Okay. All right. So do we have any questions coming through from the audience? So feeling that, I'd like to thank Neve again for an excellent presentation and perhaps we can have questions at the end again for Neve if, if people want to raise them. So uh, the next speaker is uh, David, David Howard from the University of Edinburgh. David is a postdoctoral fellow and he's been doing really exciting work, including depression in UK Biobank uh, with PGC data. And his presentation recently won a um, uh, presentation prize at uh, WCPG. So uh, I'll leave you, hand you over to David now. Thanks very much. Okay. Can you see me okay, Jerome, before you go? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, thank you for the um, opportunity to speak to the PGC Worldwide lab meeting today. Um, as Jerome said, my name's David, based up in Edinburgh. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, genome-wide metric analysis of depression that we've done up here. Um, and the work was presented at World Congress, but there is some additional material in there. So if you've seen the talk before, you, you will actually notice there are some new changes in there. And I can't get my slides to go forwards. <laughs> There we are, right. Okay, so it's been a really fantastic uh, year for genetic analyses of depression. Um, there's been a couple of really good papers come out. Um, the first was from within our own group. Um, that was a sort of genome-wide association study of depression in the very latest sort of UK Biobank release. Um, so that was in half a million people. And that was followed by um, the PGC paper um, led by Naomi and Pat, um, and that identified 44 risk variants for depression or major depression. The PGC paper was a meta-analysis of 35 different cohorts um, from right around the world and it did include the UK Biobank in the bottom right corner um, and that was the interim release so that contained roughly 30,000 people and we wondered what would happen actually if we took out those 30,000 people and replaced it with the very latest release, and that would give us uh, 360,000 people in, uh, from UK Biobank instead. So this would give us a meta-analysis of the HIDA tool um, analysis um, of 23andMe using their discovery cohorts. Um, it would be the broad depression phenotype from UK Biobank that was published earlier in the year, and it would also then be the PGC results from Raya tool but excluding 23 MUKB um, from that PGC group. And this would give us a, a total of roughly 800,000 people, a uh, quarter of a million uh, cases and well over half a million controls. Now in terms of the phenotypes available within those cohorts, 23 Me um, was based on a self-reported clinical diagnosis of major depression. Um, and the UK Biobank phenotype was based on just the answers to a simple couple of questions. Have you ever seen a GP or a general practitioner or a psychiatrist for nerves, anxiety, tension, or depression? And if you answered yes to either of those questions, then you were classified as a case, otherwise you class as a control. Um, we supplemented the cases with additional information from the hospital records. So that anyone who had uh, been into a hospital and picked up a uh, classification of depression would also be classed as a case. Uh, we excluded people who were, were identified as being um, bipolar or schizophrenia or had received a prescription for an antipsychotic treatment. Um, and we also excluded people from in the controls who'd also picked up a mood disorder um, record in hospital or were prescribed antidepressants. So this is likely to be the, sort of the, the broadest definition of uh, depression used in this study. Um, of the remaining um, cohorts available in the PGC, they were all based on the sort of DSM criteria or hospital and ICD coded uh, uh, records. So, I mean, the, the, the remaining PGC cohorts are, are probably the very strongest. So, um, that's our sort of strictest definition of depression. In terms of the meta analysis itself, um, we applied standard sort of quality control. Um, we only looked at variants that had an imputation accuracy. 
um, of greater than 0.6. Uh, we looked at minor allele frequencies greater than half a percent. And um, we made sure that each of the variants that we assessed was available across the three cohorts. This gave us roughly 8 million variants with which to conduct the association analysis. Um, the meta-analysis was uh, done using invariance weighted, uh, variance weighted um, approach in metal. And then to identify those variants that were independent, we firstly uh, did clumping to identify the loci that contained variants that were significantly associated with depression, and then conducted a further conditional analysis to identify the independent variants in each of those loci. So as a reminder, um, the PGC paper um, earlier, the year, earlier in the year found 44 hits for depression. That number's now gone up, and we've managed to identify 102 independent loci associated with depression. In terms of the Manhattan plot, um, the only uh, chromosome that didn't have a significant hit was actually chromosome 21. Um, all the other chromosomes produced uh, significant hits. Um, so actually, with, um, one of the criticisms we may face is that, uh, yeah, these are great, but can you replicate them? Well, we were lucky and that we were able to gain access to a replication cohort from 23andMe. Um, this cohort is completely independent to the one that was the discovery, um, so there's no sort of family members across the two, um, and it used the same uh, phenotype as the discovery as well. So that was um, a self-declared uh, diagnosis of major depression. Uh, this replication call was absolutely huge. I mean, it had one and a half million people in it, nearly in half a million cases and over a million controls. Um, we weren't able to access the sort of full summary stats, but they allowed us to, to look up, or they looked up for us, the uh, 102 variants that we found to be associated with depression. And of those 102 variants, they were all seem to be in exactly the same direction um, across the both, both the meta-analysis and the replication. And in terms of significance, 97 over the 102 were nominally significant, and 87 out of the 102 were significant after applying a bomb for any correction. What we can also do in terms of replication is look whether the variants that were identified in the studies that contributed to the meta-analysis to see whether they were close to variants that were found in our meta-analysis. In fact, all of the variants found by Hyde all, so that's using 23andMe, were within one megabase of a significant variant in the meta-analysis. Roughly three quarters of the variants found in Howard et al, in UK Biobank, and Ray et al in PGC were within a megabase of a significant variant. Um, we can also go a little further than that, and um, so here are the results from the Hyde et al paper. Um, and in the sort of central, central box, we have the direction of effect. Um, so the direction of effect for um, 23andMe is in this first column. And we can actually see that all except this one variant here, the second from bottom, was in the identical direction. Um, and the p-values in the meta-analysis are in the column um, at the edge of that box. Um, and it looks as though many of the variants found by Hide at all in 23andMe have been able to be replicated in the meta-analysis. Um, we can do the same thing for the UK Biobank. Um, and again, we find um, of the variants available, um, at least 14 out of the 16 are in the same direction. And again, many of the variants found in the UK Biobank are replicated in the meta-analysis. And then finally, we can actually look at the PGC results. And Actually, it was only 38 of the 44 that were available across all the three cohorts, but actually they were all in identical directions and a vast majority of the variants found by Rayetal are still genome-wide significant um, in the meta-analysis. So it looks like we've got really strong evidence of the variants that are in the public domain from the three contributing cohorts and the meta-analysis itself, they all seem to have uh, this consistent effect on depression. What we can also do to check the validity of the different phenotypes that we've used is to conduct a sort of genetic correlation uh, analysis. And simply by just looking at the genetic correlations between the, the three different contributing cohorts. And we can see that uh, UK Biobank, which is the broad depression phenotype, is still really well correlated um, with 0.85 with 23andMe's definition and 0.87 with the PGC definition. And, and that, if we think back to what Neve was saying, where she had um, genetic correlations about 0.83 between her bipolar um, 
different uh, different cohorts of bipolar, it seems that we've got the same sort of um, effect within depression. It, it, the phenotype is important, but actually the underlying genetic architecture is actually really similar. Um, we can also extend our genetic correlation analysis and use the LD Hub software, which allows you to assess the genetic correlations of our meta-analysis results across a whole range of different traits. And I think there's roughly 42 traits there that we found to be significantly correlated with depression. Most of them have been found previously, either by the, myself in the UK Biobank paper or by Naomi um, in the PGC paper. But a couple of novel ones were um, related to a positive correlation between Crohn's disease and depression. And there also seemed to be genetic correlations between an earlier age of menopause and an earlier age of smoking initiation and depression as well. What we can also do now we've identified these genetic correlations is to assess whether these genetic correlations have a causal effect or bidirectional causal effect with depression. And we did this using the sort of two sample MR approach that's been developed by Bristol. Um, and to assess this, um, we made sure there was no so sample overlap between our risk factors and our outcomes. Um, and we ensured that there were at least 30 genetic variants available um, in the risk factor that could be assessed in the outcome as well. In terms of the analysis we did, we firstly checked to ensure there was no directional horizontal pleiotropy. Um, if we found evidence of pleiotropy, we would have stopped, but none of the uh, causal relationships that we tested provided evidence of this horizontal pleiotropy. Uh, next, we tested for variant heterogeneity. If we found no evidence of variant heterogeneity, we could do the inverse and the MR inverse variance weighted regression. And what we're looking for is causal relationships that have a p-value of less than 1% after FDR correction. If we did find evidence of variant heterogeneity, we'd still do that um, same regression, but we'd also look for evidence from additional sensitivity analyses, and that included the weighted median MR and the MR agar approaches. So in the paper, we um, present three uh, potential causative relationships um, involving depression. The first of which was having depression having an effect, a causal effect on whether someone was ever or never a smoker. There was no evidence of variant heterogeneity, so we didn't form the variance weighted median or the MR EGA test. Um, we did identify a bidirectional um, causal relationship between depression and neuroticism, and there was evidence of variant heterogeneity, so we did conduct the extra test. However, when we spoke to Gibran Imani, who developed the two sample MR, he suggested that actually what we really should be doing is actually removing genetic variants uh, that are associated with both neuroticism and depression. And when we did that, it just actually became clear to us that actually the um, only um, causal relationship that survived FD, uh, false discovery rate testing was actually the effect of neuroticism on depression. Um, and I, I think that sort of makes sense intuitively. I mean, neuroticism is a, a sort of constant trait, whereas depression is more episodic. So potentially th this makes more sense to us as well. Um, we tested it again using the weighted median, and this had a similar effect as the IVW approach. But actually the MR EGA approach, it does have a very large standard error, but it did seem to have a negative effect. So we you know we should be using caution when reporting these sort of Mendelian randomization results. So here we have the um, nominal uh, significant um, causal relationships that we identified. Uh, at the bottom of the screen in the red box, I've also put the significant relationships found by Rayatul using the PGC data. So I'll just highlight a few of the sort of overlaps there. So in with the black asterisks on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, we did actually identify in both the Ray at all paper and the current meta-analysis, a bidirectional effect between schizophrenia and depression. However, in our meta-analysis, it was a nominal uh, significant um, association, but that didn't survive FDR correction. Uh, the red asterisk um, is a, we found a nominal association between depression and coronary artery disease. This was tested within the Ray at all paper, but they didn't find it to be significant. We don't find it to be significant after test, uh, testing, multiple testing correction. Finally, the blue asterisks, um, Ray et al. found a causal relationship between BMI having an effect on major depression. However, in this study, 
and the current study, we found an effect of depression on a number of different sort of related traits, so body fat, obesity class, and waist hip ratio. But obviously, our, our um, findings in the opposite direction. However, we we didn't, you know, this is a nominal um, association, so um, we need to do further work there to really try and understand that uh, relationship. Okay, so to do outer sample prediction, uh, we conducted polygenic risk score analysis, and we've rerun that since the WCPG, um, and we've adopt, adapted, um, we've adopted the rare tool pipeline. And what that's meant is we've moved to an unrelated uh, sam subset of Generation Scotland. Um, so in using the rare tool results um, to predict intergeneration Scotland, which has a um, city diagnosed MDD, we found we could predict roughly 0.8% of the genetic, uh, the total phenotypic variance. Using the current meta-analysis, um, we could actually increase this up to around 1.5% of the variance in Generation Scotland. Now, based on a suggestion from Nick Martin at uh, WCPG, um, we've actually extended this further to include the Munster and Bidirect cohorts. Um, and that's one reason why we've shifted to using the Ray at all pipeline. And the Munster and Bidirect cohorts have shown to us that the R squared in those cohorts is uh, about two and a half and three and a half percent, three and a half percent, three point three percent respectively. Um, but we're still um, verifying those, those results. But we'll have those in the, the, the final paper. But what we can also do with our data is to estimate and um, partition the heritable uh, components. Um, we estimated the heritability to be, to be around 9%. And then when we looked at which regions of the genome, which parts of the genome tended to fall within that heritable component, a great majority of it was in the conserved region. So it looks as though those variants that are um, associated with depression have been in the population, human population for a very long time. We can also use LD score partitioning uh, to try and give us a bit of me mechanistic insight into what the heritable component is enriched in. And it certainly seems to be enriched in the central nervous system. Certainly when we looked at the cell type groups, um, based on this central nervous system finding, we then thought, well, it makes sense to have a look what's happening and at the brain, different brain regions. And um, we've identified that it tends to be the frontal regions of the brain. Um, so the anterior cingulate cortex and the frontal cortex all seem to have this enrichment um, for depression variants. Um, we then conducted a gene analysis in MAGMA, um, and this identified roughly 270 genes that are associated with depression. Um, we can also then look at some zoom plots. Um, here we have the um, two different variants close together, um, but they are in separate loci. Uh, one seems to be in the NEGAR1 gene, um, that's the one on the left, and then the one on the right is in a sort of non-coding uh, RNA uh, region. We also find a strong signal in the SORCS S3 gene. And what's quite interesting here is that even variants that are some way away from the main uh, result, uh, the main hit, um, and the LD is below 0.1, it's actually still enough to drive a significant signal there. And then finally, we've got um, an interesting region on chromosome 18, um, where on the, the left there, we've got a significant variant in the RAB27B gene. And then in the next loci along, we've actually got two variants within that particular loci. Again, one is in a non-coding RNA region, and another one seems to be right in the middle of the TCF4 region. We can also use the genes uh, to identify gene sets um, which are associated with depression. And this allowed us to identify 15 different gene sets associated with depression. Um, we looked at the categories that these gene sets sort of fell within, and they seem to fall within um, either um, the sort of main block involved in synaptic plasticity and activity, but there also seems to be another um, block that seems to be involved in how an organism responds to sort of external stimuli. Um, so in this plot here, the um, lower triangle is the number of genes that overlap between the two regions and the upper right triangle is a portion of genes that overlap. The final thing we can do is look at the interactions between the genes that we find for depression and the drugs that are currently available. And of the sort of 270 genes that we found to be associated with depression, 
37 were reported to interact with about 220 different drugs. And these 220 drugs belong to roughly 54 different drug classes. So in the schematic here, uh, we have the genes on the left-hand side of the plot with the most significant for depression on the top. And, and then the number of interactions with drugs within a drug class are shown on the right-hand side. So the one that really stands out is the one that runs from sort of the top left to the bottom right, and that's shown in red. And that's a lot of interactions between the dopamine receptor D2 gene and drugs that fall within the NO5 and NO6 classifications. And these classifications typically contain the antipsychotics and antidepressants. And that's you know, a good proof of principle there that we're able to detect these. But what we also note is that there's a lot of um, drugs contained within different drug classes that could also um, influence the genes that are involved in depression. But we all need to be careful there because the, the, one, the other large regions is the LO1 uh, drug classification. The LO1 contains typically drug treatments for cancer, but we know those cancer treatments quite often have a negative effect on depression. Um, so we will need to do a lot more work before we actually can make diagnostic uh, use of this sort of uh, interaction analysis. So in summary, we found uh, 100 genetic variants, 270 genes and 15 gene sets associated with depression. There were roughly 40 genetic correlations of which three are potentially novel. Uh, we found two causal relationships with depression. And typically the variants that are associated with depression were enriched in the frontal regions of the brain. Um, we also identified a, a number of plausible gene and drug interactions and our analysis also suggested some future repositioning targets. Um, a paper describing the work I've just been going through is available on BioArchive. Um, we've actually heard back from the uh, Nature Neuroscience where the, the manuscript is at the moment and they've accepted the work, uh, accepted publication in principle. So hopefully we'll have this paper out in the next sort of few months. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everyone named on this slide. Massive thanks to the PGC, UK Biobank and 23 and me for letting us use the data. And finally, a huge thank you to Welcome for helping fund the work. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, David. That was great. Um, so we have uh, a couple <laughs> of questions. So uh, I think Jonathan Pollock has a question. So Jonathan, if you want to raise, do you want me to ask a question, or can you? Do you want to um, ask? Do I? Where do I? Nah. I think I can. Okay, he's got Q and A here. Yeah, I'm just having a sorry. So, okay, so the, so the question is, if you condition on individuals showing one significant SNP, what is the probability that this is associated with other significant SNPs in these individuals? So I guess the question is, if you take a set of individuals that all have, let's say, one of the stronger effect SNPs, the risk version thereof, what patterns of association do they show? Um, mm. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, yes, I'm not really sure. We'd have to uh, do some further work to really try and understand what the patterns are within those re you know, low site that uh, share LD. Okay, but you, you have analyzed a bum box type approach. We have done that previously, yes. Uh, and we plan to rerun that again in the future, yeah. Okay, so, um, and then Yuri has a proper science question and someone else has a, why did you choose a bat gene figure, Dave, and not other animals? Um, the bat gene, well, it was getting towards Halloween, really. And actually, it looked quite effective. It uh, did present it quite nicely. Um. Okay, that's fine. We'll accept that post hoc justification. Um, so anyway, so, and Yuri, you've got a, you've got a, a, a question. Um, yes, the MR. It looks like uh, how to interpret the difference with Ray all for the BMI MR. What potential factors would you consider? Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be... Say what the, what the Ray et al. finding was for BMI. That's right. So the Ray et al. found an effect of BMI on depression. So BMI is potentially causal for depression. However, in our study, um, we found nominal evidence of an effect of depression on BMI. Um, I mean, that, that could be believable. I mean, it, it may be a, a bidirectional, um, an, a bidirectional that effect. Um, but I mean, I think both the um, effect sizes were 
weren't big and the significance um, the standard errors were big as well. Um, so I, I think, yeah, we need to potentially wait till we've got a larger data before we can really assess this in any great depth. I think we, we can treat these as putative associations for now. And certainly, even I, I certainly wouldn't count the non sort of significant, uh, the non the nominally significant associations as, as reportable. Okay. Um, and so I think then, do we have any other any other questions from the audience? No, I, I don't think we have any more questions. I I just like to take the opportunity to talk to thank the both speakers today for doing an excellent job. Uh, the talk will be uh, posted up on the PGC YouTube channel. If you have any further questions, just just drop drop uh, either of the speakers an email or send send it to the relevant PGC group. Um, but uh, thanks thanks to everyone for attending today, and thanks again to the to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Thank Bye. you.